So our next unit is looking at agriculture. And even though you may not own a farm, agriculture impacts our daily lives multiple times during the day. When we eat food, we are inadvertently making decisions that have consequences that relate to the environment. Are you eating organic food, non-GMO food? Did you pick it up at a farmer's market or did you pick it up at a Harris Teeter? And all these different decisions we make have impacts. Sometimes they're impacts to our health, sometimes they're impacts to the environment, and a lot of time it's both. So although no, you may not have a farm, you're definitely eating food, and you're definitely making the decisions about the foods that you do eat, which in turn are going to impact the environment. So this unit, we're gonna talk about how we do agriculture in the United States and the different practices that most farms employ and how that impacts the world around us. But then we'll also make it a lot more practical as well and talk about the decisions you can make that can help to alleviate some of the issues that we're gonna see in this unit. So before we can really dive into the different issues surrounding agriculture, it's important to understand where do we do agriculture or really what land are we doing agriculture? Although there's enough, a lot of numbers on this slide, I'll emphasize the ones that I really want you to know. So the first three rows are just taking a look at our agricultural land. So if we look at Earth's surface, only about 29% of it is land in the first place. The rest of it is ocean. Of that land, so each of these bars is breaking down the bar above it, of this land, about 70% of it we can actually live on. And of the land we can live on, half of it gets used for agriculture. Which is actually kind of impressive if you think about it. Half of it's agriculture and 1% is of all the land we can live on on Earth is actually urban land, like where we live uh, here in Montgomery County. So here's the numbers I kind of want you to focus on because this ties back to our last unit, thinking about the relationships of organisms in our ecosystems and energy transfer. So of this agricultural land, 77% or a majority of it is being used for livestock. So this is either uh, pigs, cows, chickens that are roaming on open land or this is referring to cropland that is used exclusively for livestock feed. So 77% of this agricultural land is going towards feeding or um, providing space for our livestock, whereas only 23% is actually going towards crops that you and I consume. So if we take a look kind of separately, because you may say, oh, well, if we're using all this land for livestock, we must be getting a lot out of livestock. But in reality, we don't. So food caloric supply. So if we look at the calories that you and I are consuming and where those calories are coming from, only about 17% of our caloric supply is coming from meat and, and dairy products coming from our livestock. Only 17%. Whereas 83% an overwhelming majority of our calories is coming from plant-based foods. It's coming from the grains. It's coming from our fruits and our vegetables. So this, just these two bars here are really demonstrating that energy transfer we talked about before, that if we eat crops directly, there is no middleman in this case, say cows, that we actually get a lot more energy. There's a lot less energy loss. But when we feed all those crops to cows, there's a lot of energy we lose there, uh, energy we could have been consuming directly. Now you may say, well, sure, we're not getting calories from that meat, but obviously meats have lots of proteins. Well, this study also looked at proteins and they said, okay, if you look at all the protein you have in your diet, only about a third is coming from meat and dairy products and two thirds are coming from plant-based foods. So I'm not a vegetarian myself. I personally try to limit the amount of meat I eat, but this is kind of compelling evidence as to how being a vegetarian impacts our environment because it uses a lot less um, space, it, but it supplies a lot more calories and a lot more protein in comparison to meat. So if we're running out of land, then we really need to focus on crop production because crop production can take us a lot further than creating food for our meat or creating space for our meat. 
So again, you're not going to need to know these exact numbers, uh, but you should know like overwhelming majority of our agriculture lands used for livestock and overwhelming majority is used of of plants is get where we're getting our calories from and where we're getting our protein from. So all farms are not created equal at, at all. Uh, if we look across the entire world, we estimate that we have about 570 million farms. Uh, so this is, this is a lot. Now I'm going to share with you a couple of different sizes of farms because we have huge mega farms. That's kind of what's common in the United States. But then we also have small backyard farms that are used to sustain populations. So these numbers, uh, everything's given to you in hectares. And the way I kind of visualize hectares is if you have two football fields next to each other. So that would be one hectare of farmland. Now there's going to be a lot of numbers coming up, but what I'm going to want you to do is somehow visualize these numbers. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. So let's start with this first bullet point. So worldwide, farms of less than one hectare, so less than two football fields together, account for 72% of these 570 million farms. So most farms around the world are incredibly small farms. Now, despite the huge amount of small farms, they actually don't control that much land. Yes, they're less than a hectare, but you would think, well, if we have so many of them, they control a lot of land. But in reality, they don't. They're only owning a very small amount of the land. If we get a little bit larger, hectare, uh, farms that are one to two hectares in size, so two to four football fields in size, account for about 12% of all farms, uh, so, so a good chunk of them, but only controlling about 4% of the land. So these really small farms, uh, if we add both of those together, that's 84% of all farms, controlling over only 12% of the land. However, looking at mega farms, so only 1% of all farms in the world are larger than 50 hectares, but they control 65% of the land. Honestly, this is almost a analogy to kind of the world's wealth, like 1% of the top um, income people own like 80% of like the amount of income that people below them make, things like that. So here we see the top 1% owning a majority of that land. And here in the United States uh, and other developed countries as well, that's where those 1% is. That 1% are in these huge mega farms, mostly in developed countries. They do exist in developing countries, uh, but a majority of them are in the US. Uh, there are some in South America as well. Now, I don't care if you know these numbers or not. Similar to the last slide, what I care about are trends. What is the general takeaway? Do the small farms own a lot of land or not a lot of land? Are most farms big or are they small? Now, a much easier way to do this is to graph this data. And what I'd recommend is combining it into one graph, or you can do it in two different graphs. But there's two things that you want to look at. One, what percentage of farms are these different sizes? So what percent are less than one hectare, one to two hectares, etc.? But then also, how much land are they controlling? Are they controlling a lot of land or a little bit of land? So that's what I want you to graph. You can either do that in two separate graphs or in one graph. Um, but keep in mind, there's a missing piece. I tell you less than one hectare, one to two hectares, and bigger than 50 hectares. Obviously, we're missing uh, a chunk there. So you'll need to calculate quite simply, just adding and subtracting, but you'll need to calculate those percentages as well. So take your time to do that um, and share your graph in the Pio Cafe just to see uh, what others come up with and make your general trends from that. Don't try to make general trends from all of these numbers. So now we have an idea of what our farms are like around the world. So let's take a look at how we can separate our agriculture and our types of agriculture. So one type of agriculture is our industrialized agriculture. And this picture is a pretty good summary of what industrialized agriculture looks like. You typically have huge monocultures 
So mono meaning one. So we're talking about one crop being grown. In this case, this looks like this might be wheat uh, or some other grain. And we have a huge, huge field, uh, really as far as you can see, tons and tons of this one single crop. This would be an example of that 1% of farms. Huge mega farms, they grow one thing, but they're also very specialized in that one thing. Yes, they have tons of different machinery, but it's actually the same exact machine. You can become an expert in how do you grow that food. You can become an expert in how do you harvest that food and process that food. So there are some benefits to it because you can become an expert in that food. And usually if you can become an expert, you can increase the yields of it because you know what kind of fertilizer works, what kind of pesticide doesn't work. Uh, and it also is going to generate a, a large amount of food as well. So that's one type of agriculture. The other type of agriculture is these small farms, the less than one hectare, or maybe one to two hectares. And we refer to it as traditional subsistence agriculture. So traditional in the sense, like obviously industrialized agriculture has not been around forever because we haven't been industrialized forever. And subsistence refers to making food for yourself uh, or your family. If you have a slightly bigger farm, maybe you're making foods to sell at a local farmer's market or to your neighbors. Uh, but the thing is, is you're not producing, you know, tens or thousands of pounds of produce. I mean, you're creating produce on a very small scale. Now, typically, these are going to be polycultures. Because if you're feeding yourself, you don't want to grow just corn. You don't want to eat just corn. You're eating lots of different types of foods. We typically see this in the developing world because they don't have that industrialized agriculture. So if they want to get food, uh, it's much cheaper just to grow your own versus going out and purchasing food. This would also potentially be your own backyard. Maybe you grow um, some vegetables yourself. And so that would be a type of traditional subsistence agriculture. Now remember, this was actually what a majority of farmland was, about 72% of farm farms were these really small farms. And although they don't control that much land, uh, they produce about 80% of the world's food, which is kind of crazy to think about. So what's, what's the necessary or necessity for these huge monoculture farms? It's just because we have so many families that are producing their own food and can subsist themselves. If you think about China and India, some of the countries with the largest world populations, a lot of them are farmers. If you look in the rural areas, a lot of them are farmers selling to or providing food for themselves and selling it to the local community. And so all of that's considered subsistence agriculture. So it produces a lot of the food. It has a lot of the land, uh, or sorry, it has a lot of the farms, but the actual amount of land that they use uh, is quite minimal. Another reason for that as well is a lot of our industrialized agricultures are being used for, uh, for livestock. So they're not necessarily producing food for humans, uh, they're producing food for uh, our livestock such as chickens and cows. So we're going to go ahead and take a pause here uh, before we start on with our next slide.